Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Today, me and the boys will be ranking the mainline Mega Man X games. I do prefer the classic series more than the X series, but that doesn't mean I don't love this series. Obama, shouldn't we start with the classic series first for continuity? I would do the same, but the head honcho wants to start with this one, so my hands are tied. Meanwhile, I prefer this series far more than the classic series for the gameplay and narrative. The classic series is not a bad series, but it's too slow for my preference. A sleepy game for a sleepy Joe, I say. Really, man? Trump, please, let's all get along and get this tier list started. So let's get started with the first game, Mega Man X. Do we even need to talk about this one, Barry? Slap this masterpiece into S tier. We all know it goes in the S tier, Donald, but let's talk about it. So this game starts with X being contained in a capsule in an old ruin, this ruin belonging to our beloved Dr. Light. Dr. Light unfortunately dies before being able to see his beloved creation in full function. So the doctor keeps X in this capsule to test him to make sure he comes out as a good robot that wants to keep peace. Many years pass, and X is eventually discovered by a man named Dr. Kane, an archaeologist. He examines X and discovers he is capable of free will and human emotion. Kane eventually creates robots based on X's design called Raploids. Eventually, some Raploids go rogue and terrorize society, which they brand said Raploids as Mavericks. A group called the Maverick Hunters form up and takes them down to attempt to keep peace in the world. So X, feeling a bit responsible for the creation of said Mavericks, joins up with the Maverick Hunters to help the best he can. Him and his best friend and Giga Chad Zero are now eventually tasked with taking down Sigma, the leader of the Maverick Uprising, along with his eight followers. Can we talk about this intro stage first? This stage is straight gas. I definitely agree. When I first started this series, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this newer series that diverged from the classic series in a big way, but it helped ease players like us in with no issue introducing mechanics one step at a time. Heck, even dashing wasn't available until you acquired it in one of the stages, so it can ease you into that game-changing feature. Truly outstanding design. Meanwhile, this is my only personal complaint about this game as a whole. It starts a bit slow. That's, of course, on multiple playthroughs, but the first time through is great at introducing you into the world of Mega Man X and what to look forward to. I couldn't have said it better myself, gentlemen. But personally, I don't think the game starts slow like you said, Trump, but you do you. You bet your ass I will. So anyways, at the end of this stage, you face your first boss named Boba Fett. I mean, vile. And he is riding a mech suit. The fight with him starts immediately, and it's hopeless. Of course, you won't know that on the first run. The best you can do against him is to shoot lemons at him. You eventually lose. Vile grips you in his hands, and you're about to die. But wait. What's that sound in the distance? It's a charge shot, and blam! It blasts the mech suit's left arm right off. Here comes Zero coming in to finish the job like a badass, but Vile gets away in the carrier. X says he is too weak to beat him, but Zero reaffirms to X that he will get stronger once he reaches his full potential, maybe as strong as Zero. This just sets the getting stronger narrative in stone. So with that amazing stage done, I'll field some info beforehand to save time going forward. These games tend to have the same formula. Fight eight bosses, find upgrades, go through some final stages, fight the same eight bosses again, and then beat the final boss. The eight Maverick bosses all have animal motifs in this series, and the ones you fight in this game are Chill Penguin, Spark Mandrill, Armored Armadillo, Launch Octopus, Boomer Kuwanger, Sting Chameleon, Storm Eagle, and Flame Mammoth. Are we gonna look at the bosses in this video, Barry? Not really. It would take quite a long while to do that, especially with each game's bosses. If this video is well received enough and people want it, we might give it a try later on. But these stages though, they're quite basic in their designs, but it's not a terrible thing considering it's the first game of the series. Gotta start somewhere. And Barry, I must say, these stages are pretty great. Some stages change depending on if you finish another stage, lending to the world being connected with one another, making it feel bigger, instead of feeling like eight separated zones that sit in their own space. Also, there are all kinds of power-ups to find in these stages. Four of them have armor upgrades, one being mandatory to complete the game. 
All eight stages have heart tanks that permanently upgrade your health, and four of them have sub-tanks that can give you health in a pinch if you're about to die. Not that I ever need them. You're straight capping right now, Donald. Those Sigma stages are a plague on your health bar with all the shit in your way. Come on, Joe. Use the charge shot for Sting Chameleon's weapon and get invincibility to breeze by all of that shit. That is actually a great segue to the weapons, which are some of the best weapons in the series for their sheer utility alone. Homing missiles help with hitting hard to hit enemies. The flamethrower decimates close up enemies. Boomerang cutter helping reach hard to grab items. And do we talk about Storm Tornado being busted, you guys? Goddamn Storm Tornado is very good. You'll never have a problem with a regular enemy again. I agree. The arm parts makes these weapons even better too. Rolling Shield can charge into a shield that instantly kills super low health enemies like those bats. Homing Missiles fires a barrage of missiles. The flamethrower shoots a column of fire that travels on the ground until it hits the end of the ground it's on. Storm Tornado hits enemies directly above and below you. And the most broken of all, Chameleon Sting will make you straight up invincible for a certain amount of time. Meanwhile, shotgun ice reminds me of ice cream. The charge shot lets you ride on a penguin, which reminds me of my friend Sub-Zero Steve. He would- Joe, stop right there. No one wants to listen to your boring stories. Sub-Zero, Joe, are you thinking of Mortal Kombat? Combat? Uh, uh, Steve was a great fighter back in those days. Gonna stop you right there, Joe. You can also find a secret weapon in Armored Armadillo Stage 2. It requires all the armor, sub-tanks, heart tanks, and all the weapons. The secret weapon is the Hadouken from Street Fighter, and it can one-shot anything. Before I forget, this whole soundtrack is straight gas. All of it. Oh, man, you said it, Barry. My personal favorites are Storm Eagle, Flame Mammoth, Boomerang Kuwanger, Sting Chameleon, and Sigma Stages, one and two. Truthfully, though, all of these tracks slap so hard. I love it when you have a W like this, Joe. I couldn't have said it better myself. Even the password screen is a jam. All right, where were we? We were at the part where you finally get to Sigma's fortress. This place consists of three stages that tests all of your skills to get through. You also have to fight the eight Maverick bosses again as you make your way through it and fighting a new boss at the end of each of those stages. The first one being the bow spider, just a big robot spider that climbs up and down metal poles in a determined pattern. The second boss is a big room called Rangda Bengda. Weird name, you have to take its eyes out and its nose too. The third boss is called the D-Rex. It sends the halves of its body around the boss arena and also fires off energy blasts too. To cut in for a bit during the first stage, you find Vile in his mech suit again, and he has Zero trapped in an energy cage behind him. Vile is ready to go for that rematch, and you fight him again like in the intro. But wait, this is weird. You still can't hurt him. Even with all the upgrades you've acquired, you eventually lose again, and Vile is about to finish you off. But Zero ain't having any of that shit and blows himself up to even the odds, destroying the mech. X suddenly gets a burst of energy, and then you fight Vile properly. Now you finally finished Vile off. As you check on Zero, he isn't looking too good. He basically tells you to finish this fight, and he dies. Even in death, Zero is still a true badass. Well said, Trump. So anyways, once you get to the final area, you finally reach Sigma, but you have to deal with his dog, Velgarda, first. Once we neuter that dog and put him down, Sigma comes back and reveals he has been cosplaying as a Jedi this whole time. We show him that he isn't a real Jedi and he blows up uh, all except for his head. It joins up with a giant wolf body in the background. This is the true final boss. You can only damage him with the upgraded buster or with a rolling shield. He is even immune to the Hadouken Trump mentioned. Which is such bullshit. Come on, Donnie, I thought you didn't need such an overpowered weapon. I thought you were so good at this game. It's called styling on the enemy Joe. I wouldn't expect you to understand such a concept since you're so bad. Once he is dead, X escapes the fortress as it crumbles into the water. He then thinks about why must Rayploids and humans have to fight one another and hopes that the fighting can stop one day. All right, now that we've talked about it, let's put it in the only spot it needs to be in. Say it with me now, gentlemen. S tier. S -tier. This game does way too much right to not warrant an S-tier spot, and frankly, it deserves it. This was an amazing first impression that still has people singing its praises to this day. Hard agree, Barry. This set a gold standard for how the gameplay should be in this new series, but it does take a little nosedive as we move forward. Let's not get too ahead of ourselves, Donald. 
Now, we're gonna look at the sequel, Mega Man X2. Personally, I think this game takes a dip in quality, but let's get into it. This game takes place six months after the first game. Maverick activity is starting to rise again, and after finding chips on captured Mavericks emblazoned with the Sigma icon, Dr. Kane tracks it to an underground factory. X is sent to put a stop to this activity. He would have had a companion with him, but Green Biker Dude sacrificed himself in the name of Neo Arcadia. He was a great soldier, fought for his family, friends, and the stars and stripes he loved so much, without a doubt, having the truest of qualities that every soldier should strive to achieve. He will always live on in our hearts forevermore. Rest in peace, Green Biker Dude. Um, what was that, Donnie? Let's just let him have this moment, Joe. You also get introduced to a group of three Rayploids called the X-Hunters, Agile, Violent, and Surges. They want to rebuild Zero and currently have three of his parts, but need the control chip to reactivate him, but Dr. Kane has that in his possession. You can hunt these three to get the parts back and change the ending a little. Of course, I'll go out of my way to do that because Zero is my boy. If you're going for a certain type of run and want to get that ending, it's a shame that they end up in random stages. It more than likely will break your boss order in order to achieve that goal. And I feel like this could have been done better somehow. After taking down the factory, a new Maverick uprising begins. We now have to take down Wire Sponge, Wheel Gator, Bubble Crab, Flame Stag, Morph Moth, Magna Centipede, Crystal Snail, and Overdrive Ostrich. These new stages are a bit more imaginative instead of just being in standard looking locations. You're in a weather changing station, a giant dinosaur tank that is actively ravaging a city, an abandoned missile base where you have to stop a missile from being launched, to name a few. I bet Overdrive Ostrich's stage is the thing of nightmares for you, Barry, stopping such a big, beautiful missile from being launched. Shut the fuck up, Donald, or I'll send that missile to your golf course. Geez, calm down, it's just a joke, man. Anyways, th these stages are far more interesting as far as themes go, but sadly that they don't affect each other when you finish another stage like in the first game. This is definitely one of the more disappointing parts of this game for me. It was fun to see how the stages affected each other in one, but here in two, nothing. Kind of a bummer, but it's not a terrible game because of it. Can we talk about this soundtrack though? It's kind of mid in this game. The first one had strong instruments that punched hard, but this game sets back the tone and doesn't feel as powerful, you know? I sort of agree with you, Donald, but there are some decent melodies to be found. I jammed to Overdrive, Ostrich, Flame Stag, and Bubble Crab stages. The rest are just fine to me, I guess. The jams aren't as strong here, and that knocks some points down. Aside from that, the armor is just about better in every way. I know we did forget to dive into the first game's armor, but the armors could be a video on their own. Dashing in the air, extra charge shots, and a screen nuke. The helmet is still pretty bad, though. And these weapons don't feel nearly as useful as in the first game. They're mainly here for gathering upgrades and boss weaknesses, but nothing more. Speedburner's charge shot gives you a second dash in the air, even if you dash jumped. That's an incredible thing for this game. Bubble Splash is a fantastic shield weapon when fully charged. The strike chain feels like it has majorly missed potential as far as what could be done with it. Can that be blamed on technology limitations? Maybe partly, but Super Castlevania was also a game that had a great whipping weapon that was fantastic, but I do realize that's a different topic altogether, so I'll leave it right there. So anyways, you fight all the bosses and the usual business, and you are able to go to the X-Hunters base in the far north. These act as Sigma's fortress stages, except you don't refight the eight other bosses. There are only the X-Hunters at the end of each stage. I'm also bringing this up now because there is a secret weapon in X-Hunter Base Stage 3. You have to navigate a dangerous spike-filled area and slide down through a secret wall to get to this capsule. Side note, you have to have all of the armor upgrades, all eight heart tanks, all the sub-tanks filled, and all of Zero's parts to find this capsule. You get the Shore Yukon from Street Fighter II, and it works almost the same way as the Hadouken in the first game. It can only be used at full health and can one-shot bosses. This uppercut is a little harder to aim to make that happen, so there is some skill that needs to be used to make bosses get one shot, otherwise they take heavy damage. So once you defeat all the X-Hunters, you have to fight all eight bosses again in a teleporter room. 
kind of like in the classic games. Once that is done, you only have Sigma to deal with. All right, Sigma is the big bad again in this game too. You better get used to this pattern because it's only going to keep repeating ad nauseum. Before that encounter though, this part will depend on if you gathered all three of Zero's parts. If you didn't do that, you have to fight Zero and knock him back to his senses. If you do gather his parts, Sigma will sick a knock off Zero at you, only for the real one to swoop in and show him what a cheap copy it really is. That's my boy Zero. Show them who's boss. So now we have another face-off with Sigma, now cosplaying as Wolverine from the X-Men. He shoots out electricity and can also teleport on top of you as a dive attack. And once we beat him, it is revealed that Sigma's true form is that of a computer virus. Not just any virus, though, the Sigma virus. This is a straight upgrade of the Maverick virus that makes Raploids act violent. It does the same things, but the Sigma virus also allows Sigma to exert some influence on affected Raploids. It also explains why Sigma keeps coming back over and over in this series. So after this boss fight, it ends the same way. X again pondering about how long this piece will last. We get it, X, you don't like fighting. I'm in the camp of this game being in the A tier. It doesn't hit the high notes of X1, but it still has some improvements for the overall formula. I think I'm in agreement with that sentiment as well. A couple steps forward, but a couple steps back. I think I'm in the same boat as well. Mm. So far, we seem to be agreeing with these games pretty nicely. Now, we will look at the last game in the Super Nintendo trilogy, Mega Man X3. And this game starts with Sigma's Rebellion finally being crushed by the efforts of X, Zero, and the Maverick Hunters. However, Maverick activities in general continue to be a problem. Now we are introduced to a new character named Dr. Doppler. He identifies and names the Sigma virus and claims to have made a cure for said virus, along with other Maverick symptoms. He is celebrated as a hero, and Raploids and cured Mavericks gather where the Doctor is and establish Doppeltown, a perfect utopia with the Doppler leading them. Months later, the cured Raploids begin to riot. The cure only being a placebo in the long run, Dr. Doppler seems to be the source of the riot, declares war on the world, and puts his city under martial law. X and Zero get the call to infiltrate Doppler Town and bring Dr. Doppler to justice, only to suddenly get a distress call from HQ for being under direct attack by Doppler's forces. They swiftly turn back to repel the attack. Once you both split up, you play as X and progress as usual. You suddenly find a familiar face named Mac. Who? Anyways, after asking where he has been, X is suddenly captured by him, exclaiming that he works with the doctor now and that X is too trusting. Wait, who is coming through the roof? It's Zero. You can actually play as him. His health bar is huge. He has crazy powerful charge shots, even has a sword. Playing as Zero was an unexpected and interesting treat. He is far more powerful than X and sweeps that one robot we don't know about in one fell swoop. Zero the GOAT saves X from being captured and checks around HQ while X presses forward. After taking down that huge robot boss in the intro, we will fight another eight Maverick bosses. Blizzard Buffalo, Toxic Seahorse, Tunnel Rhino, Volt Catfish, Crush Crawfish, Neon Tiger, Gravity Beetle, and Blast Hornet. Before we go any further, I want to say that this game is my favorite in the series. Oh no. What the hell, Sleepy Joe? Are you going Maverick right now? X3 is the most mid-game in this whole series. How can you have such a shit take? Shut up, Donald. I love that these stages are quite a bit larger than the usual stages we have gotten. It provides a great sense of exploration and discovery of secrets in all of them. Only you would love these larger stages. They just make me sleepy. Then again, your shit take makes all the more sense. As we mentioned before, you have the ability to play as Zero, and he is a powerhouse to be reckoned with. I'll give you that one for being able to play as Zero, but you can't fight bosses with him in this game. He just fucks off right at any door. They did my boy dirty. The new armor looks amazing, and you get some great upgrades to your arsenal. Dashing upward along with dashing left or right while in the air is great for getting to the hard-to-reach places and spawning a shield that reduces damage taken even further than the amount the body armor already provides. How convenient of you to leave out the helmet and buster upgrade in an attempt to make your argument better. After that rigged election, I know all of your tricks, Sleepy Joe. The buster and helmet upgrades are complete garbage. The helmet is a paperweight with a strategy guide or just game knowledge. And don't get me started on that buster upgrade. 
This combined shot gimmick was not necessary. It was fine the way it was in X2. It's so much harder to aim this shot than to simply shoot two charged shots back to back. For the last time, Donald, that election was not rigged. You lost fair and square. Anyways, this game also introduces the enhancement chips for your armor. These pieces can further enhance the capabilities of the parts you equip them to to make them that much better. Dang, you're right. How could I forget enhancement chips? Oh, wait, they're all worth as much as scrap anyways. The best ones are the feet and helmet upgrades, but it sucks ass that you can only get one upgrade and can't even swap them out. You're stuck with whatever you happen to get. Even then, those don't matter because of the golden armor in Doppler Stage 1 where you get all of the upgrades anyways. What's the fucking point in all of that, Joe? Enough, you two. The both of you were acting so well until this game. It's not that bad of a game, Donald. Are you really going to defend this game, Barry? You know just as well as I do how dull this game is, and that's after me knowing that zero can be actually played. It doesn't do enough right or wrong. It's just a wet fart everyone forgets overnight. I guess I can't completely disagree with that statement, Donald. However, this game does have some merits that I can't completely ignore. Such fake news, Barry. Fake news! Donald, how can you seriously think that when this game has a great soundtrack? That intro music before the title screen is very foreboding and sets the mood for the game very well. Gravity Beetle might be the best stage music in the Super Nintendo lineup as well. Can you also tell me that finding all of these secrets wasn't at least exciting when you first played this game? It was cool to find the ride armors that you could use. And finding those enhancement chip capsules had to have at least gotten you excited about the possibilities for what they can do, right, Donald? Sure, I thought that at first for the enhancement chips and the ride armors, but they all have one thing in common, Sleepy Joe, wasted potential. The ride armors aren't really used for anything. They're just tacked on with no purpose behind them being there outside of certain upgrades. Also, why add these enhancement chips only to make them pointless in the same game with the golden armor? Sure, if the golden armor wasn't there and you had the ability to switch between enhancement chips, that's one thing, but that's not how it works. You're stuck with the first chip you get, and it locks you out of the golden armor if you get even one of them. It's just bad design. Donnie, I'll acknowledge that you have good points, but I suppose nostalgia is what makes me like this game so much. I played this one after X1. I never did play X2 until much later. And this game just sticks out more for me in a good way because of how it made me felt. Nostalgia is a powerful thing, I suppose. I appreciate the concession, Sleepy Joe. I guess nostalgia can't be reasoned with. But as long as you acknowledge my opinions, I can live with that. If you two have made up, let's get back on track here. We did go over some key points already from that argument earlier. Lots of features in this game just go in halves and never really reach their full potential. Zero being playable, ride armors, and the enhancement chips. These all aren't fleshed out much. The weapons are mostly mid, but we do have some standouts. Frost Shield can force spawn health from certain enemies. Acid Burst does the same thing, but for weapon energy. Parasitic Bomb can track enemies. Thunder Triad isn't a terrible shield weapon. It can come in clutch and also shoots out three lightning bolts. And Spinning Blade can decimate regular enemies while the charge attack is a spinning yo-yo of doom. You really played that last part up, Barry. That yo-yo is just plain fun, you know? I'll agree to that. I just remembered Thunder Triad being able to charge to slam the ground to make lightning trail on both sides of you. What I never understood is how that makes boulders hanging with ropes fall in Tunnel Rhino stage. Why isn't Spinning Blade the weapon to use to make that happen? That makes zero sense and it adds to my problems with this game. Part of me wants to say you're nitpicking, but I still agree with your complaint. It's not exactly intuitive to come to that conclusion yourself if it's your first time getting around that obstacle. I can definitely understand that one. Uh, that took me a bit to figure out what needed to be done to get around that obstacle. You said a bad thing about this game, Joe. Call me surprised. As much as I love this game, that part always brought a sour taste to my mouth. I will say that the backgrounds for these stages are so nice to look at. The background when you reach outside on Toxic Seahorse's stage, the power plant's devices glowing with electricity, and Gravity Beetle's stage is the best in my opinion. The sunset in the background, so beautiful. X3 also brings back the stage changing gimmick, but not to the level of X1. Blast Hornet makes the head gunners weaker in other stages if you clear that stage first. 
It also clears out boxes in Gravity Beetle stage to get a heart container, and that's the only way to obtain this power-up. I really hate this heart container's location. It really slows down the pace of the game with how you have to backtrack to get this thing. And there isn't any other way to make it faster. Finishing Volt Catfish makes the streetlights come on in Blizzard Buffalo's stage, even though it's just for aesthetics. It also provides power for the factory and vial stage. With all of that behind us now, let's get back to the game itself. After finishing off two Maverick bosses, you see a cutscene where Dr. Doppler is watching X and wants to capture him again. He sends two Mavericks, Bit and Bite, that are called the Nightmare Police, to go find X and bring him back alive if possible. We also see the Mandalorian, I mean Vile, back from the dead to do the same. But Vile leaves to handle this personal grudge his way. Bit and Bite can show up in any of the stages you play in. There are special rooms in the middle of all of these stages that you have to pass through, and there is a chance that Bit or Bite will show up. Bit always shows up first, and then Bite always shows up second. For Vile, you have to find a teleporter in any of these stages. Blizzard Buffalo, Volt Catfish, and Crush Crawfish. You get sent to a rundown factory where you find Vile and have a boss fight. After you deal with him, you have to escape the factory before the timer reaches zero, which then it blows up. After that, this game will have many different variables for the end game, depending on how you handle these boss fights. So about how there are variables in the end game, there are different boss encounters in the Doppler stages, depending on if you finish these bosses with their weapon weakness or not. If you don't destroy Bit and Bite, you will fight them combined together at the end of Doppler stage one. If you don't destroy Vile in the factory, he will show up in a more deadly mech rider as the boss for Doppler stage two. Also, fun fact, you have to destroy Vile if you want the secret weapon of this game, Zero's own Saber. You have to play as Zero before a specific boss encounter. He gets too injured to continue and gives X his Saber before retreating. It doesn't one-shot bosses, but it's still hella strong all the same. With all the Doppler stages done, you now fight Doppler himself, who has gone Maverick. Not a hard boss fight at all, but time your shots cause he can heal himself. Once he is defeated, he seems to return to normal and tells you he has been working for Sigma the whole time and was developing a battle body for him. You hurry on to try to catch him, and again, Sigma is here in a new body, now cosplaying as Captain America from Marvel. He can shoot projectiles that travel along the floor and walls and can also throw his shield around too. You eventually take him down only to now show you the ultimate body that Doppler was working on. He is now cosplaying as a Hulkbuster. Obama, this joke is getting old. Fine, fine, I'll stop. Kaiser Sigma moves from side to side, launches mines and missiles that home in on X, and has a beam that can deal damage if X is in the beam itself. Even after this boss fight, it's not over yet. Sigma puts up a gamble to take X's body and fills the whole area with lava. You have to escape the lava and you get cornered by Sigma. The way this ends is dependent on Zero. If you died at all while playing him in the game, or if you get the Zero Saber weapon, Dr. Doppler comes in with an antivirus that puts down Sigma and will choose to stay behind in his crumbling fortress. If Zero is still around, Zero shows up to do the same thing and you both escape, looking out onto the destruction. As much as I love the Saber as a weapon, I hate that it gives the bad ending to this game. I'd rather have Zero along with me at all times. The ending is the same as usual. X wondering about why they must fight and all that. I might end up going with a D tier on this game. Sure, it's fun to play, but it missteps way too much. It also did my boy Zero dirty, and that's hard for me to forgive. Too low, Donald. Meanwhile, I would put it in low A or at least high B because I love the ambition this game had, and I accept them all flaws and all. It can be seen everywhere with this game and its concepts. Too high, Sleepy Joe. Uh, with me, I'm in the middle on this one. I get behind Don's frustrations with this game, but I also do enjoy some things about it too. I see the ambitions it had, Joe, but they didn't go far with them. That's why I think C tier is the right placement for this game. I guess it is what it is. I'll live with a C tier for this one. Before we move on, I'm gonna go for a pee break and I'll be back in a bit. I'll order a couple of Big Macs in the meantime as well. Catch you boys in a few. I'll grab an energy tank energy drink in the meantime. I feel like I'm gonna get sleepy with how these other games are gonna go. Catch you boys later.